Nobody was the one at prayer meeting. Nobody was the one that you always see up at the church every time you drive by working for the kingdom of God. Nobody was the one that was faithful. Nobody was the one who was actually walking the walk. But one time, Brother Paul, the church was in need of a Sunday school teacher. So everybody thought anybody would do it, and anybody thought somebody should do it. So guess who ended up stepping up to the plate? Oh, Joe. They had some believers once move into their neighborhood, and everybody thought somebody should witness to them. Anybody could have made an effort, but guess who finally won that family to Christ? Oh, Joe. Joe Nobody. And I want to tell you this, for those of you who are always looking for a prophetic revelation from God, I've got one for you. Everybody is called to do a work of God. Everybody. Everybody is called to prayer. Everybody is called to be faithful. Somebody say amen. And everybody in this place is called to reach the lost. If you want to know what God's looking for today, he's looking for a nobody. God's looking for someone that's going to put him first and not themselves. Someone God, someone God wants is someone who needs no uh, self-uplifting. We need no personal edification. And when we do that, when we finally get to that place where we surrender myself, Lord, I don't want to live by Justin's rules, but I want to live by your rules, then we're going to put away our fleshly eyes and we're going to grab onto the spiritual eyes of God and we're going to begin to do his will. Amen? It's not about me. Somebody say it's not about me. Just like Brother Huntley had mentioned, I know I'm not worthy. I know I'm not worthy, but worthy is the Lamb. Somebody say, worthy is the Lamb. Lord, I know I'm not worthy to be up here preaching right now. I've done things in my past. I was born a sinner, saved by grace, and I know I'm not worthy, God, but that ain't going to let that stop me because worthy is the Lamb. The will of God in my life is not going to depend on my worthiness, but it's predicated on God's worthiness, amen? It don't matter what I want. It don't matter what I do, but it matters what God says. Somebody say amen. If you'll stand with me, we're going to read the Word of God. We're going to turn to 1 Kings chapter 17. We're going to start at verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. Does anybody else feel as good as I do right now? I was talking to some guys today, and I said, I've, I've preached a few messages now, and I, there, there's some of the messages I feel like I've got to strain really hard and get put together. Some of them come, come easier. But I said, I've, I've never been as excited about his message as I am this one. If something crazy happens to you when you begin digging into the Word of God, you learn something. I like that. There's an anointing behind that. There's an anointing behind the Word of God. When you get into it and you learn it, you don't want to stop. You want to keep digging. And I found some. I'm going to tell about a story tonight out of the Bible. And I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of these other preachers did. I'm sure pastors even preached on it many times. But I it's, it's amazing how much little details you can find in one story in the Bible. How amazing it is that God, God just connected. I mean, it's just perfect. There ain't no other word but just perfect for, for how God used these people in the Bible. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse number 1. Sister Crystal, I'm going to use y'all's Bible, okay? And Elijah the Tishbite who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, King Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain. Everybody say, no rain these years, but according to my word. Verse number 2. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. A lot of y'all that know Brookie from Pocahontas, that's how she got her name, the brook Cherith. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. I want to bring something out. God told Elijah he's not bringing any rain. There's not going to be rain. There's not going to be any dew. There's going to be a drought, a famine. You're going to be walking on dry land, and it's going to be for a few years. 
but I'm going to sustain you. I'm going to keep you. And right there, go back one more scripture. He said, I've commanded the ravens to feed thee. Ravens are scavengers. Isn't it crazy sometimes the, the way that God will use something crazy in your life to bless you? He said, I'm going to use the ravens. I'm going to use the scavengers, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sustain you. I'm going to feed you. And, and, and that's just crazy to me. Verse number 5. So he went and he did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. Last scripture. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. I apologize, there is one more scripture. A drought, a famine. 1 Kings 18, 41. They're walking on dry land. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Somebody say abundance. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we want you to have your way tonight, God. Lord, I believe your power and your spirit's inside this place so mightily right now, God, that anything could happen. Lord, I ask you to anoint my, my mind and my heart, Lord, and give me the words to say right now. Jesus, I want you to open up the windows of heaven, God, and pour out your spirit and your power inside this house. Lord, we want to see people baptized in your name tonight. We want to see people filled with the Holy Ghost tonight, Jesus. Lord, we want to feel your spirit, God, just like the day of Pentecost as a rushing mighty wind. Lord, we want you to sweep across this house tonight, God, in a mighty way. Change our hearts. Change our minds. Lord, transform us tonight, Jesus. And everybody said in the name of Jesus. Jesus, you can be seated. Are you going to preach with me? Let's do it. So Elijah prophesies that no rain, everybody say again, no rain. No rain will fall. And in spite of the famine, in spite of him walking on dry land, he finds himself having plenty of food and water. There are two things to remember when you're going through a drought in your life. Many times we think, the world's weighing down on us. I'm the only one in this whole world that's going through the problem I'm going through, this drought that I've been going through this whole time. Remember that you're not the only one going through it. You're not the only one that's affected by drought. Just like Elijah, there was many people around him that was affected just as much as he was. And number two, remember that God will sustain his children. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us but he's with us until the very end. Somebody say amen. God will feed you when you're hungry. God will clothe you when you're naked. He will give you shelter when you have no other place to go. I'm talking about a God, the Scripture says, that sticks closer than a brother. It's a God that, that when you feel dried up and you feel the effects of the lack of rain, he's Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Does anybody, has anybody realized that tonight? Have you experienced that in your life, that in your time of need, he's Jehovah Jireh, your provider? And in this same passage of Scripture, God spoke to Elijah, and he told him to go to Zarephath. Many of you know the story. Uh, Zarephath was a small Phoenician town, and he said there's going to be a widow lady there. And I have commanded her to sustain you or provide for you. So when he came to the town, he saw the woman there, and he asked her for some water. He came to the gates of town. The Scripture says she was there picking up sticks. And uh, he asked her, he said, uh, fetch thee, I pray, to get me some water. So she was going to do it. God commanded her to do it. And while she was on her way to get the water, uh, Elijah hollered at her, and he said, fetch thee, I pray, some bread. I'm thirsty and I'm hungry. And that's when things started happening. The widow woman looked at Elijah, and she said, I have a handful of meal and a little oil. Just a handful of meal and a little oil. I was about to prepare it for me and my son that we could eat and then die. For we know how the story goes. Elijah told the woman to make first cake for him and then after cake for her and her son. And that if she did that, her meal and her oil wouldn't run out until the day that the Lord sends the rain. So the woman does as Elijah says and the scripture goes on to say her food didn't run out. And God supplied her need through her sacrifice. God will supply your need through your sacrifice. But another problem arises. The widow woman's son becomes very sick, and the Bible says the sickness was so bad that there was no breath left in him. 
And the woman asked Elijah, why did this happen? And Elijah takes the child, it says, from her bosom and, and takes him up to the loft. And he began to cry out to the Lord. And, and he stretched himself, the scripture says, over, over, the, over the son uh, three times. Now when Elijah brought the son back, the Bible says the, the, the voice of the Lord, he heard Elijah's cry. And, and this happened, that's when the miracle happened, and she revived the son. And when Elijah brought the son back to his mother, she said, By this, by this, I know that thou art a man of God. And the word of the Lord that you speak is truth. And I believe that especially in these last days, if we were to obey God just like Elijah obeyed God, God would use us for great and mighty things. Does anybody agree? We would witness miracles, signs, and wonders. And people that we come and talk, talk in contact with would say by this, by what just happened, by how you're living, I know that he is the Lord, the God, and I know the word that you speak is truth. Amen. I believe God is trying to get us to a place to where we're not only witnessing and we're not only giving Bible studies from the words of our mouth, but through the actions of God. God is wanting people to get a revelation of truth through the miracles that He performs through our obedience. It's not us just reaching the lost. It's not going to the highways and byways. Not only this, but it's what the miracles that are fixing to start taking place, the miracle signs and wonders that God is wanting to use in our life to reach the people. He wants to make it undeniable. There's no question about it. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 1. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Number two. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. God tells Elijah to go find King Ahab, and then he will send the rain. When you're going through a drought in your life and God tells you to do something and then promise you he's fixing to send the rain, you think you would go? Elijah went. Elijah does what God tells him to do. He gets there, and he finds out that they're also in a drought. Sister Crystal, verse 5, if you got it. And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land unto all fountains of water. And unto all brooks, peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. There's one thing we must know about Obadiah before we go further. Although Obadiah, he's a member of, of King Ahab's court, uh, the scripture says he's actually the governor of his house. They all serve Baal. They all have different gods. They don't believe in Jehovah. But one thing about Obadiah is he still believes Jehovah. He serves Jehovah. And since Ahab was a king, we know that he would have all the power to take any food and any water that was available. So he and his people were always the last to be affected by drought. So the length, we found out here that they're also in a drought, so we know the length and the, the severity of this drought had put the king in the exact same position as everyone else. He was searching and scavenging for any means of life. So Obadiah goes on his search, and while he's on his search, looking at all the brooks, trying to find water, trying to find anything that will maintain life for these animals and for himself, he runs into Elijah. And Elijah tells Obadiah, he said, go tell King Ahab to meet me. And now when King Ahab came and he met Elijah, the location, and I, this is something I just now learned, I didn't know, the location that Elijah chose to meet him was very planned. It was very strategic. It was a mountain that was known for its dense forest and its beautiful scenery. And it was a place that was very highly favored by King Ahab's god, Baal. So everyone knew if Baal wasn't able to bring down fire on that mountain, it wasn't going to happen anywhere. Somebody say amen. And everything Elijah did, it was, it was always very planned and very strategic. The people of Baal believed their God slept at night. So Elijah gave them the opportunity to, to call on their God all day long, all the way up until the evening, for the fire to consume their sacrifice. He even mocked at them once, saying, uh, your gods must be asleep at noon. 
And with, and, and with him following the prophets to call for fire during the day, it was even a possibility that fire could have sparked on the dry altar. So we've got to remember there's no rain, there's, there's no anything. It's just cracked ground, dust flying everywhere. But the heat of the sun was possible to spark a fire underneath their dry wood. But after the prophets of Baal tried to call down fire from their God all day long with no answer, Elijah began repairing the altar. Elijah began repairing the altar. It's called the evening sacrifice because there was no chance of help from the sun. Elijah said, if I'm going to do this, I want it to be undeniable. If I'm going to do this, I don't want them trying to justify any reason for this happening other than the one true God did it. Jehovah did this. And I love it when I see a miracle take place in somebody's life or a healing or a cancer or, or something happened, and they say the doctors can't explain it. The scientists can't explain it. But we got a remedy tonight, church. We know the one true God. Hallelujah. I love it when I see somebody filled with the Holy Ghost and they say, I, I, I can't deny it because I just did it, but at the same time, I can't explain it. Amen? But you know what you just experienced is true. You know what you just experienced is real. So Elijah takes these 12 stones according to the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob, and with the stones, he built the altar. Around this altar, it says Elijah made a trench. It said it was uh, big enough to fill two measures of seed. But uh, he placed the wood on the altar. Elijah got the bullock. He cut it up into pieces. He laid it on top of the wood. And the very next thing that Elijah did is something that, that God showed me while I was getting this message together that I, I've, I, I probably should have. I don't know, but I've never realized this before, but it's so powerful. And this is what God's wanting to show us. The very next thing he did, he already had his sacrifice. He had the bullock, and he already, he already made his altar. But Elijah said, fill four barrels with water. Fill four barrels with water and pour it on top of the sacrifice and on the wood. And here they are. They're right in the middle of the biggest drought that they've ever seen. They already have a sacrifice with the bullock. But Elijah says, get me what we have least of and pour it on top. Then he said, do it a second time. And then he came back, he said, do it a third time. And the scripture says the water ran about the altar, and it filled the trench. We know the story goes on and tells that the fire of the Lord fell, and it consumed the burnt sacrifice, it consumed the wood and the stones and even the dust, and then it said it licked up the water that was in the trench. The Baalites presented their God with their sacrifice, which was the bullock, but Elijah presented his God with a bullock and 12 barrels of what he was most desperate for. Somebody say amen. If nothing else tonight comes from my message, this is the point that I want to get across to you. Sacrifice is not what is easy to give. Sacrifice isn't what always, is, is always easiest to give, but sacrifice is what is hardest to give. It's the things that we hold on to that we don't want to let go of. That's what God is wanting. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse number 39. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. 41. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Abundance is coming from a place of true sacrifice. Somebody say amen. The bullock wasn't the true sacrifice, church, but the water was the true sacrifice. It's easy for us to sacrifice something that we're going to lose anyway and that we've got plenty of, but God wants that sacrifice that you're not ready to let go of. The thing is that we are scavengers, just like the ravens in the Scripture that it talk about that fed Elijah. But instead of bringing our sacrifice to God, we hold on to it. Because we're afraid if we ever let it go, we're not going to get it back. But God is trying to tell us if we'll let go of our true sacrifice that he's going to bless us, church, beyond measure. If we'll let go of that one thing that we're holding on to, God is going to give us an abundance of rain. Amen. Is anybody tired of walking on dry land? Is anybody tired of living through a famine? Is anybody tired of only being sustained by God and you're ready for a little rain in your life? But God says, I'm not just bringing the rain, but I'm bringing an abundance of rain. Amen? Why don't we just raise our hand for just a minute? Lord, I want an abundance of rain, Jesus. 
Lord, I'm tired of walking on dry land. I'm tired of only being sustained, Jesus, Lord, but I'm ready for an abundance in my life. Lord, I'm ready to see my family filled with the Holy Ghost. Lord, I'm ready to see the will of God play out in my life. God, I'm ready to get busy about my Father's business. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Just like the widow lady and her handful of meal and a little oil, give what you're in need of not what you can spare. Give what you're in need of and not what you can spare. When I was getting this message together, God began to speak to me and tell me what I honestly believe our true sacrifice is. And just like they were in a drought, I believe that there's many of us in a drought tonight. And the sacrifice, the one thing that I think is so hard for us to let go of that God is wanting from us is our time. I'm not talking to you about money. I'm not talking to you about selling everything you got. I'm just talking about time. How hard is it to put in our time? God's wanting a sacrifice of time from his church. It's easy for us to give money. It's easier for us to give money than it is to give our time. It's easier for us to say something that needs done than to actually to put the time in to do it. It's easier to put our time in on Sundays and Wednesdays, but we forget about the rallies and the revivals and the prayer meetings and the other church functions that we're not getting to because we just don't have enough time. Work takes too much time. School takes too much time. But where's our priorities, church? Remember, Elijah didn't just fill up four barrels of stuff that they had to spare, but he said, go back a second time. Go back a third time. Elijah's trying to get into a place that where he wants an abundance. How many of us will be like Elijah? Are you tired of being where you're at? I know we're going to leave tonight, and probably 90% of this church ain't going to get it, and we're going to leave change, but you 10%, if you're ready for an abundance of rain, it's time to give our time to God. Amen? It's time that we give our time to God. If you want out of your drought, give God your sacrifice, church. If you're tired of only being sustained by God, then give God your sacrifice. If you're ready to see your children saved, give God your sacrifice. If you're ready to see your spouse speaking in another tongue, give God your sacrifice. If you're ready for your healing to come into your life, it's time to sacrifice. If you want to live with an abundance of rain in your life right when you're in the middle of your famine, it's time to give God our best sacrifice. I'm talking to somebody today that's feeling something in their spirit that is far greater than what you're seeing in your life right now. Your life may be in a drought, but God is speaking to you about rain and abundance. You may be going through a dry place right now and feel that God is only sustaining you through your famine, but God wants you to know that an abundance of rain is about to fall in your life. The blessings of God are about to pour out in your life. The Spirit of God is about to make His presence known so strongly in your life that there's no devil in hell that could stop it. There's no temptation out in this world that could shake it. God is about to elevate somebody to a place that is far greater than what you can see in your life right now. It's a place of abundance. I wish somebody right now would just raise their hands and receive the Word of God. God is fixing to re bring revival, I believe it, to your family. God, bring revival to my family, Jesus. Bring me the rain. Lord, I'm tired of where I'm at, God. I'm not satisfied with where I'm at, Jesus. But I'm ready for an abundance in my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I hope you speak to somebody tonight, God. I believe so strongly God is trying to get through to somebody tonight, and I hope, I hope that you're letting him do it. Let's talk about something else that we must have. We must have if we want abundance in our lives. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Where there's no vision. Where there's no vision, the people perish. Everybody say where there's no vision, people perish. If God has given you a vision, if God has given you a dream or a burning desire to see something fulfilled in your life, don't hide from it. Don't hide from it. Don't be scared of it. But it's time that we claim it. It's time that we claim it 
and we take that step of faith. Have you ever heard something in your spirit that seems so completely different than what you see in your life right now or in your situation? There's something greater in your spirit that, than the way that you're living. There's something greater in your spirit than what you're seeing in your life. That's vision. If you feel something down in your spirit that is far greater than what you're seeing in your life, that is vision. It's vision from God. He's planting something down in your soul that will let you know where you are, that where you are is not where he's planning on taking you. It almost seems like a contradiction even of circumstances. With my own eyes, I can't see anything anywhere, but in my spirit, somebody say in my spirit, I hear a sound of abundance of rain. Dad had a vision that God had to work for him to do in Paragold. We quickly found out that outside of our church, nobody else shared that vision. Many other people didn't feel the same way he felt. But the thing is, that vision didn't come from people. That vision didn't come from people. It came from God. When God tells you something and other people don't agree with you, you don't need them in your life in the first place. If God tells you to do something, if God gives you a dream, if God gives you a desire to see something fulfilled, if God gives you a vision and somebody don't agree with it, say, well, I, I'm, I apologize, but this is from the Almighty God, amen, and I'm not backing up from what he tells me to do. When God deals with you like that, it may drive you completely crazy. When God gives you something, it may drive you completely crazy. It may scare you, but you won't be satisfied until you follow the will of God. After a while, Dad got to where he couldn't even drive into the town of Paragould without bawling and feeling such a pull to reach this city because God placed that in his life. And let me say this while we're on the subject. Unless you're your own pastor, unless we're pastoring our own church, our first vision should be our pastor's vision. It's okay. Give God a hand praise. Our first vision is our pastor's vision. If we're not on the same page as the man of God in our life, we're not in the will of God. But when Dad said, nevertheless, not my will, not everybody else's will, but Lord, your will be done, and he made that move, God has backed us and he has blessed us ever since and every step of the way. God has given confirmation so many times and blessed in so many different ways. It's unreal what all God will do in your life if we'll just follow his vision. And we have a pastor that doesn't settle either with small vision. But we have a pastor that has a greater vision. Somebody say amen. One of the greatest factors... One of the greatest factors in our churches today that stunts their growth is small vision. Because vision will do one of two things. It will either restrict you or it will fuel the fire. Vision will either restrict you or it will fuel the fire. Church, we have a great big God that has great big plans. So I believe if my vision is anything smaller than great, I'm not on the same path that God is on. And maybe it's just been quoted so many times that it's lost its authority that it once had in our lives. But the scripture we just read a moment ago, where there is no vision, the people perish, still stands true to this day. And in my opinion, small vision is way too close to no vision. And since we as the children of God have the job to reach the lost and to help grow the kingdom, small vision, I believe, should have no place in our lives. It's time we quit letting our surroundings dictate our vision. Quit letting our problems dictate God's purpose. Quit letting the famine dictate the rain. Somebody say amen. And start living not by what I see, but what I feel in my spirit. Not by what I see in my life, but the promise that God has given to me. Not what I see in my life, but the desire God's put down in my heart to see his will fulfilled. When Elijah only seen dry land... The roses were not blooming. The flowers had lost their scent. The ground had, had begun to crack. The grass is still brown. Elijah looked at King Ahab and he said, Get thee up and eat and drink. God didn't tell Elijah he was only sending the rain, but God told Elijah, I'm sending an abundance. Somebody say abundance of rain. Amen. 
I believe God is about to send the rain in abundance to greater vision. I believe God is about to send rain in abundance to the people of greater vision, to his church. Without a vision, we wouldn't be in this building right now. Without a vision, we wouldn't have church vans in the parking lot that are full right now. Without vision, we wouldn't own the land that is right here next to us. Without vision, we wouldn't have plans to, uh, to see another building in front of this building. Without vision, we wouldn't have superhero Saturday, Sister Sonia. Without vision, we wouldn't have women of promise, Sister Alma. Without vision, we wouldn't have an end-time revival like the God has promised the church. Amen. Somebody needs to get a vision. I'm ready to see the will of God fulfilled not only in my life, but in your life and in this church. I believe God has miracle signs and wonders that are about to happen. God has plans for greater vision that will far exceed any, anything that we've ever thought or even imagined. But I'm ready to fulfill the will of God in my life. Hallelujah. Without a doubt, God has sent rain to greater vision. But I believe that we're about to see rain in abundance. I believe we're about to see backsliders come back through those doors. I believe we're about to see new converts by the masses filled with the Holy Ghost. I believe we're about to see our families not only filled with the Holy Ghost, not only baptized in the name of Jesus, but on fire with a vision. I believe we're about to see miracles, signs, and wonders like we've never heard of or dreamed of in our entire life. I've heard my whole life that we're going to have an end-time revival. We're going to have an end-time revival. We're about to have an end-time revival. While all I hear and the signs that I see, the things that we see going on in Israel, the things that we see and hear about people being killed for confessing their faith, I say the end time is right here. Where's the revival? End time revival's not coming, but I believe end time revival should be here right now. And if we don't have that vision, we need to stand up and get a vision of an end time revival. Because it may be the end time revival that brings your parents back to church. It may be the end time revival that brings your children back to church or your cousin and your family back to church. It may be an end time revival that's going to bring your healing. Hallelujah, Jesus. Quit worrying about what other people think. What God has given you, it may scare you. It may seem ridiculous to you. You may be even afraid to share it with a pastor or share it with someone because they would think it's just completely crazy or the vision that God has given you seems foolish. Quit worrying about what people think. If God has given it to you, you need to know that it's very meaningful. If God has given it to you, it's powerful. You need to embrace it, and you need to profess it. Your abundance depends on it. Your abundance depends on what you do with that vision that God has given you. As long as you keep it to yourself and do absolutely nothing with it, you are stopping the rain from falling in your life. If I have unsaved family, I don't want to go without fulfilling my vision. If I have unsaved loved ones, I don't dare want to not do what God would have me to do. I don't want to let my family go to hell because I'm caught up doing what I want to do. I don't want to go to hell because I'm caught up doing what I want to do, but I definitely don't want to go to hell and let my family and my children and everybody that's around me go there with me because I'm caught up doing what I want to do. If I have the Word of God in my life, if I have a revelation of truth in my life, it's my job. I'm not putting it off on my parents I'm not putting it off on anybody else, but if I have a revelation of truth and I have family that does not, it is my duty, it is my job to see them at that altar speaking in another tongue, in that baptistry, baptized in the name of Jesus, in this church fulfilling the will of God in their life. Hallelujah, Jesus. Our abundance depends on it. As long as you're holding on to it, saying this is just between me and God. If you only keep what you have between me and you. Let me tell you this. There are very few things that are only between you and God. And vision will never be one of them. Vision is meant to be told. Vision is meant to be shared. And you may be thinking, Brother Justin, you don't understand what God has spoken to me. It's completely outrageous and crazy. But remember this. God will never, ever give you small vision. God will never, ever give you small vision. As a matter of fact, if your vision doesn't just completely scare you, it's probably not of God in the first place. 
If your vision doesn't completely scare you, it's probably not God in the first place. If the music will come, I've just got a little bit left. I'm trying to help somebody today understand what God has given you has power. The thing that God has put in your life, that dream, that vision, that desire God has given you has power. And God wants to use that. I used to think the story of Joseph was just completely crazy. I thought, man, you are dumb. You should have not have told your brothers what you told them. You shouldn't have told them that. That should have stayed between you and God. If you would have just kept those dreams to yourself, you would have never been in that pit, Brother Potter. If you would have just kept those dreams to yourself, Brother Zach, you would have never been in prison. And as I began to think this, God told me, he said, if he would have kept that to himself, he may not have been in a pit. He may not have been in a prison. But he certainly would have never been in a palace. Amen. God is wanting to take you somewhere, and you're through your dry land. You may go through your pit. You may go through your prison. But God is fixing to take somebody to the palace. Somebody say amen. Can we all stand together? I believe if we would talk about what God is wanting to do, that vision could be loosed from our lives and, and, and not be stuck inside of us. But some of us have been in a drought for so long that we're not thinking about abundance any longer. We've been walking on dry land for so long now that we've become accustomed to it. We're not thinking big anymore. We're not even thinking about God's purpose anymore. No longer are we worried about God's will because we don't have enough time in our life to do these things. Years ago, seemed like we had so much more time than we have now. But the things of this world, I don't know if it's technology or I don't know if it's just our flesh, but we're so consumed about fulfilling the will outside of this church and forgetting about God's purpose inside the church. Amen. We think when someone asks us, how's life been treating you? We say it's good. Every time somebody walks up to you and says, hey, how's things going? It's, it's going good. You know, everything's going real good. But in our mind, what we're actually thinking is, I don't know how much longer I can take this. I don't know how much longer I can keep a smile on my face. I don't know how much longer I can keep this facade going because I'm tired of walking on dry ground. I'm tired of not having rain in my life. But tonight, I want to give you a remedy for the next time somebody asks you how you're doing. You look at them and you tell them, you don't worry about that. But let me tell you about what God is about to do in my life. Let me tell you about the Holy Ghost outpouring that God is fixing to bring to my life. Let me tell you about my children, Sister Alma, that are fixing to be speaking in the name of Jesus, speaking in tongues, baptized in the name. Hallelujah. Let me testify about the healing that God is about to give me in my life. Let me tell you about the souls that are about to flood into this church. Let me tell you about the building that we're fixing to put in front of this building. If you hear the sound of abundance of rain tonight, why don't you just raise your hands right now and begin to praise God for what he's about to do. If God has given you something tonight, it's time to claim it. It's time to embrace it. It's time to profess it. You may be saying, I don't have much time to sacrifice. All I have is a handful of meal and a little oil. But God's telling someone, if you give the sacrifice, he's going to multiply it. If you give the sacrifice, he's going to bless it. Amen. I believe God is showing someone their vision right now. I believe someone is uh, showing his will for their life. God is reminding someone of their dream and their promise. If, you wanna, if you're ready for a vision in your life, somebody shout abundance. Shout abundance. Hallelujah, Jesus. I know there's people tonight. Pride may overcome you. I don't know. But there's people tonight. You're tired of the drought. Is anybody tired of the drought? Is anybody tired of the famine? Is anybody tired of the devil having your joy? Is anybody tired of the devil having your victory? Amen. Is anybody ready to see their family saved? Is anybody ready for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost? Is anybody ready for miracles, signs, and wonders? Is anybody ready for an end-time revival? If you're ready for that, why don't you begin to make your way to the front? Profess what God has given you. Don't be scared of what God has given you, but somebody get excited tonight about what God is about to do. You feel something greater in your spirit than what you're seeing in your life, but God is about to give you your promise. God is about to give you your victory. God is about to give you your abundance tonight. Hallelujah. 
Somebody shout the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Hallelujah, Jesus.